Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Jenna ben Yehuda, and I'm the Executive Vice President here at the Atlantic Council. On behalf of the Atlantic Council, as well as our forward defense program within our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, I'm really delighted to welcome all of you to the latest event under our Future of DHS project titled Building Resilience in U.S. Communities. To our esteemed speakers, thank you so much for joining us here today. The Future of DHS project convenes leaders and provides recommendations to assist U.S. national security officials as they transform the Department of Homeland Security to protect the U.S. homeland from threats such as natural disasters, pandemics, terrorism, and other future, future threats. And today's event is the final installment of that Future of DHS project series. And over the course of the project, we've had the honor of hosting a series of really important convenings, all of which you can find online. Some of these include hosting three former secretaries of DHS for a conversation exploring how the agency should realign its priorities to, to, to meet today's pressing threats to the homeland. Uh, we hosted former chairman of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Homeland Security, Benny Thompson, to discuss streamlining congressional oversight at DHS. Uh, we had Customs and Border Protection Commissioner Troy Miller for a conversation on how CBP can leverage biometrics at U.S. borders, and most recently hosted DHS Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis, Ken Weinstein, for a discussion on the current challenges facing Homeland Security Enterprise. In today's event, we're going to do a deep dive into another side of DHS within the Federal Emergency Management Agency and explore its role in working with federal, state, and local governments to prepare U.S. communities to withstand and recover from disasters. We are really, truly delighted to host FEMA's administrator, Criswell, as well as so that she can discuss the agency's goals surrounding its 2024 Year of Resilience initiative. The 2024 might not be the only year of resilience. I think it's something we're going to need uh, for some <laughs> time to come. Um, and perhaps the administrator agrees. Uh, and we're just so grateful for you spending time with us here today, Administrator Criswell. I'm really looking forward to hearing your insights over the course of the next half hour. After we hear from the administrator, she will be immediately followed by a panel consisting of federal, state, and private sector emergency management experts. And Tom Warwick, who is a senior fellow with us and leads the future of DHS work, will moderate that panel. So you'll all be in excellent hands. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Alex Hazley, who will make a few announcements and further introduce our esteemed guests. Alex is a principal at Deloitte, responsible for helping uh, for their relationship with FEMA. He and his team at Deloitte are focused on helping communities get to a place where they're not just bouncing back from disasters, but jumping forward after the fact. He started his career in the Army 20 years ago and has since been focused on addressing key challenges from cyber attacks to natural, uh, natural disasters and mass migration. He is a big believer in using the latest tech like Gen AI and GIS to ensure the U.S. is not just ready, but ahead of those future threats. Alex, we're delighted to partner with you. Please join me here at the podium. It's th wonderful to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna, for the warm introduction. I, I couldn't agree more that 2024 shouldn't just be the, the first and only year of, uh, of resilience. Um, I'm thrilled to join you at the Atlantic Council representing Deloitte. To kick off today's forum on the crucial role of the emergency management community in bolstering national resilience. This issue is a daily challenge for, for leaders at all levels of government, federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, and the private sector. Special thank you to FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell. We also today have Willie Nunn, the FEMA Region 10 Regional Administrator, Russ Strickland, Secretary of the Maryland Department of Emergency Management and President of the National Emergency Management Association, Gary O'Neill, President of the National Hazard Mitigation Association, Josh Sawislak, Deloitte Managing Director and internationally recognized advisor on climate and disaster resilience, and Andrew Friedman, the senior climate reporter from, from Axios. Your insights are invaluable to our discussion today. As we witness increasing climate-related extreme weather events like the Maui fire last August and the Smokehouse Creek fire in Texas and Oklahoma, 
alongside an increasingly expansive all hazards and consequence management mission set, it becomes ever more urgent to elevate our national resilience. The focus on how we build resilience, especially in marginalized and disadvantaged communities, cannot be overstated. I'm honored to introduce Deanne Criswell, the FEMA Administrator, who is at the helm of these efforts. Deanne's extensive background uniquely positions her to lead our nation through emergencies. Her roles have spanned from a city emergency manager in Aurora, Colorado, to the commissioner of the New York City Emergency Management Department, culminating in her historic nomination, confirmation as the first woman FEMA Administrator. Today, Ms. Criswell stands atop an ecosystem with an evolving mandate and mission that extends beyond just traditional emergency management response and recovery. While those roles are enduring, the emergency management community and its workforce are shifting to instill preparedness, mitigation, information sharing, and technology into its responsibilities with a mission set that also includes natural and person-made events, cyber, biological, and more. Today's discussion focuses on resilience, which is fundamentally about our ability to adapt and recover from adversity. However, building resilience is increasingly complex due to the fast-paced and uncertain changes around us. The 2022 Deloitte Global Resilience Report underscores this challenge, noting the evolving role of regulators and leaders in fostering national resilience. So as we dive into today's topics, let's draw on the collective expertise and insights of leaders like Administrator Criswell and our esteemed panel members. Our goal is to transform our dialogue into actionable strategies that enhance community safety and resilience against these diverse challenges. We're grateful to the Atlantic Council for providing a platform for this critical work, and I look forward to our collaborative initiatives that will emerge from our discussions today. Please join me in welcoming Administrator Deanne Criswell. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, really exciting to be here. I think this is just a nice way to cap up uh, a really amazing week where we hosted all of our state directors, territorial directors here for the week and talking about some of these really important topics. Um, I'm really excited to be able to be here today at my very first official Atlantic uh, Council event. And I'm equally excited to see how many people are so interested um, in this topic and who are interested in building resilience across America. It's something I think, as you heard Alex say, that I think a lot about. And while 2024 is our year of resilience, I think the big piece of that is that when you think about FEMA, when you think about our emergency managers, you often think about us as a response and a recovery agency. But we have such an important resilience role, and we want to use this year as that jumping off platform to lift that up. This event right here is really like a bookend to the National Emergency Management Association event that we held earlier in the week. And the topic of my keynote at that event um, was really around these resilience building efforts, but also about the evolution of emergency management. And so I'm really excited to be able to have an opportunity to further discuss some of these topics today. Let me start by setting the scene for all of you. The FEMA of today, the emergency management profession in general, is a far cry from where we started back in the 1970s. I talked a lot about this evolution earlier this week, and so let me just give you a quick summary of that. Since FEMA was created nearly 45 years ago and NEMA was created 50 years ago, FEMA has evolved from being an agency solely focused on civil defense to one focused on response to those that include homeland security and to one that's essential to recovery. We hold all of these truths simultaneously because that's what it means to be an emergency manager. We are chief problem solvers. You'll hear me say that a lot around the community. We are expert conveners. We are first responders. But in recent years, we've also had to learn how to engage in public health and cybersecurity, and that list can continue. It can go on and on. The reality is our operational tempo continues to increase, the scope of our work continues to expand, and the title of emergency manager continues to gain new definitions. Just look at the weather events of the past year, and I think that you'll understand why. Atmospheric rivers, 
fires in the tropics, hurricanes in the desert, drought, extreme heat, extreme cold. 2023, the hottest year on record. Permafrost is melting in Alaska. And 10 feet of snow just blanketed the Sierras in March. The severe weather events of today defy these historic models that we've been used to. And still, there are other threats that continue to lurk at the periphery that add to the load that we face. The FBI and CISA, they recently testified before Congress about China's ability to strike our power and our transportation infrastructure. The FBI has even warned about the potential for foreign influence in the 2024 election cycle. So why do I tell you all of this? Well, the moral of this story is we have a lot on our plate, all of us. So what is it that we should be able to do? What can we do together? The answer is work together to build a more resilient nation. 2024, as you heard, FEMA's year of resilience. It's an opportunity for us to increase individual, community, and household readiness to train and better resource the emergency management workforce, to build up local capacity, enhance our response capabilities, and enable effective and efficient recovery strategies. We want communities across America to think of FEMA and know how we have the resources that they need, that they can use to do this important work to make their communities more resilient. And we want them to invest now, today, so that if and when, and it should just be when, an emergency occurs, they can respond faster and they can recover more effectively. Sounds pretty simple, right? But what does this all really mean? What actually is resilience? It's not a new concept, that's for sure. But it is kind of a buzzword, it seems, these days. And it can mean different things to different people depending on the lens that you're approaching it from. So let me explain a little bit. I met a woman on a visit to Saipan recently whose home had been mostly destroyed by a typhoon. She sheltered under her recently replaced roof, waiting for the rest of her home to be rebuilt. She had moved her bed into her kitchen and did most of her cooking on an outdoor stove while the rest of her house was pretty much unusable. While I was there that week, the repairs on her house were finally wrapping up. And when I asked her why she did all this, why she stayed and why she never left, why she didn't seek out the resources that were available for her, like temporary housing, her answer was very simple. This is my home. This is where I want to stay. She was determined to stay, and she did. I tell this story because to me, this is what personal resilience can look like. Grit, determination, and a willingness to make it work regardless of the circumstances. I also heard another great example of community resilience a few weeks ago during a meeting I had with tribal leaders. There I heard a story about how the native village of Yuzinki in Alaska not only has a newfound understanding of what FEMA's resilience programs offer, but is leveraging our resources now to invest in preparedness and resilience back home. To them, as I said earlier, they always thought of us as a response or a recovery agency. But now they're using the resources we have, like direct technical assistance, to become better prepared for their greatest threat, tsunamis which is a huge threat in their area, and now they have the ability to protect their people. They analyzed their risk, they understood that they needed to take steps to mitigate it, and then they found the resources they needed to become more resilient. We need more communities across the United States to think like the native village of Yuzinki, to take a hard look at the risk that they face and find ways that they can be more resilient in the future. This is one of my biggest priorities as the administrator of FEMA, but also as part of the entire Biden-Harris administration. In fact, President Biden has invested historic levels of funding toward building a more resilient nation. 
He even created the first ever National Climate Resilience Framework to help guide all of our efforts. The framework unites the entire federal family in this important work. And it spells out how we should collaborate with non-governmental partners while building state, local, tribal, and territorial capacity. Because the truth is, government, from the federal level to the local level, cannot do this all on our own. We need to widen our circle and include partners from all sectors of the economy in this critical work. From academia to nonprofits, from the private sector to philanthropy, we need to work together in lockstep to create a more resilient nation. And I have seen this work begin to take root around the country on all of the trips that I take. At Florida International University, scientists have created a wall of wind simulator to test how well structures can withstand a Category 5 hurricane. In Guam, there's a coalition of faith-based organizations, volunteers, foundations, and local government personnel that came together to form Guam Strong and helped to reconstruct homes and build resilience after the typhoons. Or look at the work from the Walmart Foundation. They're really doing some amazing work in this space. They regularly fund resilience hubs in communities to help residents navigate power, housing, and communication challenges stemming from these types of severe weather events. The foundation, the foundation is even referencing our newly released community disaster resilience zones to help inform them on where they should build these new hubs in the future. These are the partners we need at the table. Partners who understand that for every dollar that we invest in mitigation, in resilience, saves six dollars in recovery. Partners who are ready to pull up a chair help us connect the dots and extend our reach into the corners of communities that we've had a hard time reaching. We need partners who can help us meet people where they are at instead of making them come to us. We need them to help us build capacity. Help us inform communities across America about the importance of understanding their risk, their unique risk, making a plan and taking action. Because like I said before, we cannot do this all on our own. We need all of you with us at the table. So before I close, let me leave you with this. Think broader. You are all here today, so I know that you are already interested in this work. But look around you and see who's missing from this room today. What other partners, what other collaborators and voices do we need to have at the table? in the rooms where the decisions are being made. And then think ahead. What will our future look like five, 10, or 15 years from now? What can we do today to improve tomorrow, and how can we do it together? And then consider the individual. With all of this talk about coming together and making big change, I want to make sure that we never forget that this work is about people. It's about the woman in Saipan who lost the majority of her home. But through resilience and determination, now has a stronger foundation and a better roof over her head. It's about the tribal citizens in Alaska who will be safer thanks to the action the native village of Uzinki took to help mitigate their specific and unique risk. It's about your neighbors, your loved ones, and your friends becoming more resilient building a resilient community, and together with our help, becoming a more resilient nation. So thank you for your dedication and your commitment to this ongoing important work, one that will last long beyond 2024. And I look forward to the rest of our conversation today. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, that was... Uh, interesting and uh, enlightening in terms of how you're thinking about this um, this year and beyond. Um, I guess my first question is the most broad question and probably one that an emergency manager gets at every single appearance. Uh, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> 
Uh, there's a lot of different things that keep me up at night. I think, you know, when it comes to this space of resilience right now, there's a couple of things that I really focus on. One is, you know, we have so many communities today, Andrew, that are having repetitive climate-related events and their ability to recover, you know, makes them weaker for that next event that's following them. But they also get this, this response fatigue, especially in our, our small jurisdictions and our emergency management offices and our first responders. You know, they're having a hard time keeping up with the repetitive nature of uh, so many uh, different events that are intensifying more rapidly, creating more complex recoveries, that they don't have always the capacity to do all of the important work to think about how do we make our community more resilient or invest the time in making them more resilient. And it's why I've been really focused this year on how we as an agency can continue to help build state and local capacity. Um, but I also worry about this um, this connection or this opportunity for you know, bad actors to take advantage of one of these events when we are at our most vulnerable, when we are at our weakest, and then you add perhaps a cyber attack into the middle of our response and you don't know if the power outage is because of the storm or if it's because of something else and it's really gonna impact our decision making as we go forward as emergency managers and our planning to be able to understand the root cause of some of the issues and how long it's gonna to take to recover. Just further taxing the limited resources that are already out there. So having heard you speak before and then hearing that mention of cyber just now, to what extent um, has the, the job of FEMA administrator, maybe even in just the past decade, evolved into needing to be a cyber expert in addition to uh, storm response and earthquake response and all the other disasters um, that, that were on uh, your plate before? Well, I think as you heard me talk in my remarks, it's not so much about being the cyber expert. Our role is always to manage the consequences of these events. I think where our expertise comes in and where you're starting to see emergency managers brought to the table more is because we have the expertise in the power of convening, the power of collaboration, of truly looking at a problem and understanding who is not at the table that needs to be at the table, bring them together. That's the expertise that our emergency managers bring to the table. We don't have to be the public health expert. We don't have to be the cyber expert. We need to be able to be the planning expert to manage the consequences and understand what the cascading impacts might be. But we also have that power of convening and bringing the right people to have those conversations. That's where the value of our emergency managers really shines through. And that's really one of the things that I've been trying to help people understand about our role as emergency managers. Yep. Um, tell me about some of the changes to FEMA's individual assistance program which I believe go into effect today. They do. Um, what difference might this make for, say, someone who just lost their home in a wildfire um, or who just incurred significant damage uh, in a hurricane, for example? Um, or if you think there's a better example, um, go for that. But I, I'm really curious as to <laughs> what this does that was different yesterday. This is really exciting time for us. These are the most transformational changes that we've made to this program in 20 years. And it's allowed us to truly take all of the information we hear from people and the barriers that they have in trying to access assistance from our state and local emergency managers and the struggles that they have in trying to help people get the assistance that they need and really breaking down those barriers and removing them so we can help people on their road to recovery faster. Um, a couple of examples, and I think the biggest one that I get probably the most applause when I talk to people about is in the past, yesterday, we'll just say yesterday. Yep. Yesterday, <laughs> you would, if, you were da if your home was damaged, um, for a certain part of FEMA's programs, I would actually go make you apply for an SBA loan, have you get denied, and then come back, and then you would be eligible for FEMA assistance. Sounds like healthcare. It, yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. 
But I think the biggest part of that is we're asking the people who we know are the most vulnerable, right, the most resource deficient, to go through this extra step just to be told, yes, you are resource deficient, mm -hmm. and then you can get federal help. It was, to me, a bit demoralizing. And so now we've taken that away. Now that is, we've decoupled those two programs, and so now any of FEMA's programs, you don't have to go through that process first. You can apply for FEMA grants, but you can also apply for an SBA loan at the same time, which some people will use, right? It's a really great resource, because our programs help jumpstart the recovery, and there are things like insurance or SBA loans that really help provide additional resources. And so that's one big example of one of the barriers that we continued to hear that people weren't applying. There's a large number of people that we would send to that route that we knew needed help, but then would never come back because it was just confusing. Um, but we've added some new programs on how to help people in their first few weeks if they've been displaced in a way that we haven't been able to before because we know that some people will go stay with their family and friends and maybe they help pay for their power bills or they buy some extra food and so this money will this money will this d displacement assistance will help them with some of those costs um, but not jeopardize their ability to get rental assistance you know once you get tired of your family and friends staying with you and now you decide you're going to go get some place to stay in a rental while your home is being repaired and so it, in the past, it would it would impact your ability to get that rental assistance, and now it's two separate programs, which I think is going to make a big difference. Many other things in there, but I think those are two really big ones that are going to make a big difference. Yeah. What are you hearing regarding early indications of how active the hurricane season may be? Because from talking to science sources, uh, Hurricane scientists are not exactly um, are not exactly quiet about their concerns for this season. Uh, you have record high uh, North Atlantic Ocean Basin uh, ocean temperatures mm -hmm. and an incoming La Nina event, both of which could converge to uh, create an extremely active season. And how does that complicate or direct the work that you're doing now into the, you know, early and middle of spring? I think, you know, I think about this in a couple of ways. One is we always prepare for a really busy hurricane season. And regardless of how busy it is, it just takes one significant right. event to really bring all of the federal government to have to come into play. Um, and so, we always want to keep that in mind, but we partner really closely with the National Hurricane Center to understand you know, what they think the prediction models are going to be. We have staff that are embedded with them. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll release their official prediction you know, in the May timeframe, and then I get actually more excited about their update that they put out in the July-August timeframe yeah. because that's when it's the busiest. Um, but it's still about, you know, it's just one. It doesn't matter how many, it just takes one. But what we've seen in our operational tempo from FEMA's standpoint is while we used to posture our agency to make sure we had enough resources for that peak hurricane season, our operational tempo is like that year round. Again, from the atmospheric rivers in January to wildfires on December 30th, it doesn't slow down for us now. And so now we've had to restructure how we approach um, our staffing and our resources to make sure that we're ready any time of the year because we're seeing it all year long. And in fact, last year we had a type of a disaster declaration, whether it was a major disaster, an emergency, or a fire disaster declaration, one every three days last year. And that's only the ones that made it to that threshold. Mm -hmm. you know, there's still those that we denied or those that state and local jurisdictions didn't even submit because they were just handling them on their own. And so we have to have this posture now year round, not just hurricane season. So speaking of state and local, uh, you know, decision makers, state and local um, resources. What does FEMA intend to do about the funding gap for mitigation projects as announced yesterday? I believe a record $8 billion in requests came in. You only had $1.8 billion available in funding. Um, are you going to publicly release how the agency decides which communities receive BRIC funding? Um, and for those that don't get that funding, uh, will FEMA help those communities understand why and suggest alternative funding sources? 
Well, we have a couple of different mitigation programs. And so the BRIC funding that you're talking about, our Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, is our pre-disaster mitigation program. Mm -hmm. and while it is incredibly oversubscribed, we also have had historic levels of funding during the Biden administration. So we've been able to actually fund more projects than we've ever been able to before. And the other part about BRIC that I get excited about is that its legacy program, the pre-disaster mitigation program, only allowed for a $5 million federal cost share. This program, BRIC, allows up to $50 million, which means we can do better community-wide projects. And the fact that we continue to be more and more oversubscribed, one, tells me that people are really understanding what their future risk is going to be, and they're putting the work in to actually draft these projects. And while we do have a limited amount of funding in here, these are projects that can also be used for some of our other programs, like our Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, which is a post-disaster mitigation program. Or we can work with our federal partners to see if they fit into one of the other programs and funding sources that are out there, or with our philanthropic partners, right? And so I want to continue to work with our communities. Please continue to oversubscribe because it also you know, let's Congress know the need that's out there, right, and how much demand there is to build these types of resilience projects. So we will work with all of these communities to, um, to uh, you know, help connect them if possible. Uh, we will release, you know, the, the um, selectees later, but it's a competitive process, right? Mm -hmm. There's a very thorough review that goes through and how we score them, and that scoring criteria is listed within the Notice of Funding Opportunity. Okay, so it is uh, disclosed. Um, so they're making me multitask here, which my wife uh, can tell you I, I suck at. Um, so uh, th this is a question that, that's come in um, from the audience either here or online. Um, how do you create resilience in communities when certain responsibilities lay, uh, lie outside of FEMA and DHS authorities? Well, I'd have to better understand like which responsibilities that they might be talking about, but you know, for us, our regional administrators, we have 10 regions, and each of our regional administrators builds really strong relationships with our state and territory directors. And they work with them to understand what the greatest needs are, because it's the state and territory directors that know their communities the best. And again, we have this, you know, the real expertise that I think emergency managers bring to the table is this power of convening. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be able to help connect the dots. We want to either be able to connect them to programs that are within our authorities and we have the funding to support, or if there's another federal agency uh, or other partner that can help support it. That's what we do, right? We, we are those chief problem solvers in trying to bring in the right partners. That's why this, this conversation about partnerships is so incredibly important because no one federal agency is gonna be able to help all of the different resilience needs that are out there. But I feel we are really positioned well to be able to bring in those partners for that specific community and really go in there and understand what their needs are and help them get on that road to resilience. Gotcha. Um, you're gonna love this question. Uh, what is a bigger hindrance to FEMA's work? Being lumped into a massive agency like DHS or congressional dysfunction when it comes to funding? Wow. You think I'm gonna love that question? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, you know, there's challenges across the board in there. You know, I, I listened to Secretary Mayorkas talk uh, the other day when he was speaking uh, at, at the NEMA conference. And it's really interesting, his perspective, where he talks about how the department as a whole is now very fit for purpose. And there's so much interdependency and interconnection between the work that we do and the work that the rest of the department does. And it gives us that opportunity to really leverage those resources. And so there's so much value in be, being able to tap into something bigger than just our agency to help support the increasing demands that we have. Um, as far as the second part of that question, you know, it's a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> Very uh, deftly handled uh, <laughs> answer. Um, by the way, I saw uh, Secretary Mayorkas, Mayorkas speak uh, earlier this week. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how funny he is. He is. Because uh, 
the moderator referenced um, him being a little bit controversial. Uh, and he said something about, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> so so that, that was pretty good. Um, so one fun question that I wanted to ask you, um, you're into triathlons, I hear. I am. Uh, that's my own personal uh, version of a total disaster. <laughs> um, how... Do, do they help you think more clearly, process uh, what you do every day, and maybe act as therapy in a certain way? 100%. You know, the time that I can get outside alone with my own head and not a lot of people around me is an opportunity to think clearly. And I remember even writing my master's thesis, and it would all just come to me while I was out on a bike ride or a run. It really does clear the mind and allows you to get focused on, you know, one specific thing. And I would go back to my car, and I would even just write notes of the things that came to me while I was running or riding my bike. But it's just that that opportunity to just have that release, and I love to be outdoors. And so while I'm no good, at any one of the events individually, I do finish, and that's the important part. <laughs> nice, that, that is very true. Um, uh, I wanted to ask one more question, and I'm like, you know, still looking for the, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, how confident are you that the agency's products, such as flood maps, mm -hmm. um, fully account for climate change, which is necessary for the resilience work mm -hmm. to succeed? For example, it, it's long been the case that many maps lack sea level rise uh, influences uh, and some inland flooding uh, where, you're, where you're setting the flood zones uh, lack uh, context from the shifts in heavy downpours that we're seeing. I know that there's been progress on that in recent years but I don't know the extent to which uh, you would describe uh, that as being done. I think it's important to remember that, that we have different types of maps. And one that gets referenced a lot is our flood maps, our firm maps, but those are regulatory. Right. And so those are regulatory maps that are based on current day risk, not future risk, to define your insurance premium today. We also have other maps that do incorporate future risk, right? You can go to our National Risk Index. You can go to some of our other FloodSmart products. Those are designed to help an individual or a community better understand what their overall risk is, what their future risk might be. Um, but when it comes to a regulatory map, you know, you don't want to pay a flood premium today for a threat that you might face 10 years from now. And so it's important to differentiate really the specifics between the two. Where we have a lot of work to do is being able to explain that better, right? And being able to drive people to a place, you know, on our website where they can just look at a what is your risk, click on there, and they can see all the different types of risks that they face today, five years from now, 10 years from now, versus just looking at what their current regulatory you know, map is on what their, their risk is actually today. So we have work to do there. Um, we're not where I want to be with that yet, but, but we're continuing to push forward. And that brings me to uh, something that I've been reporting a lot on, uh, and many other reporters too, uh, some of them a lot better than me, uh, is the insurance crisis that we have in the U.S. right now uh, because of the pace and extent and damage uh, in uh, disasters, uh, climate worsened disasters. Mm -hmm. So California, Louisiana, Florida, increasing parts of these states are becoming uninsurable. Um, does that enter into FEMA's considerations at all uh, when it comes to trying to create a more resilient country? Uh, because we have people who are moving to these states and just not buying insurance because it goes from, you know, $500 one year to $15,000 mm -hmm. the next year. Uh, 
something we think about a lot, right? You know, how we inherited the flood insurance program was because the insurance industry, you know, wasn't insuring that catastrophic risk. And we're starting to see other types of severe weather events, climate related catastrophic incidents that even if you want to buy insurance, you can't get the insurance. And so that is why this year of resilience is so incredibly important. And it's because if we can invest in resilient, resilience and we can make resilient communities, resilient communities are insurable communities. Mm -hmm. And so we have to continue to get out there and celebrate the stories of resilience so more communities can see the different types um, of projects that are within the scope um, you know, of possibility and that how they are actually impacting their insurance or their insurability, where communities have invested in creating resilience and, and still have adequate insurance coverage. How do we model that and help other communities do the same thing? Yep. Um, uh, one last question, which comes um, through the magic of the iPad. Um, this is from uh, Nitty. Uh, extreme heat costs the U.S. thousands of lives and billions of dollars across the country each year. Yet historically, it has not been treated as a disaster in the same way as floods or wildfires, for example. Does the lack of inclusion of heat in the Stafford Act tie FEMA's hands on this issue? And would the Biden administration be supportive of legislation to insert heat as an additional hazard under the act? I get this question a lot, and it's a good question because we are seeing, and 2023 was the hottest year on record globally, right? And so this is, is a current issue, but the Stafford Act uh, does not preclude us at all from declaring a disaster related to heat. But what has to happen is that the costs that are incurred by the local jurisdiction have to exceed their capacity. If, if a jurisdiction is incurring um, a significant amount of cost to help respond to a current heat event that is beyond their operating budget and the things that they do every day, then they can absolutely submit that request. And if they can demonstrate that it's beyond their capability, then certainly would be considered for a disaster declaration. I think the part that we really need to focus on is it's March. What are we doing today to educate communities for this summer that we know are going to experience extreme heat and teaching them the things that they need to do in order to protect themselves and their families? Or how do we help communities invest in mitigation projects that are going to help with these urban islands that are creating more heat? A uh, couple of, of examples, we had a brick project, I think it was last year, that we selected in Oregon to build more tree canopy, right? right? And so it's going to create cooler spaces. Or we've had other projects that uh, have built white roofs, right, to help cool the buildings. And so the mitigation and the preparedness, to me, is the most important contribution FEMA can have into this conversation about heat. Um, but our tech, our uh, regional administrators, they are in contact with our state, our territory, our local directors when they're having these heat events. We are communicating with them to see what kind of costs that they're incurring. But what we've seen so far is they're short in nature and it's not exceeding what they normally do. And so that's why we really need to have the conversation and pivot it to what can we do to build better preparedness for individuals, more resilience in the community to help give some relief, reduce the impact of heat. Great. Well, thank you very much for your perspective uh, and your insights here today and uh, for being here. Thank you. This was great. Thanks. <laughs> if we can walk this way.
that, but in agencies. Right. Yeah, I wasn't sure. You could always go through the DHS project. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Ramadan Karim, and Happy Palm Sunday for those who are celebrating. Uh, we're here to talk about resilience in U.S. communities. Uh, this is uh, one of the most important subjects uh, that the Atlantic Council uh, is addressing in 2024. Uh, these are your lives and your communities that we are talking about, and therefore is one of the most important issues in homeland and national security. Uh, I wanted to thank Deanne Criswell, the administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, uh, and Andrew Friedman of Axios for starting us off with uh, some important perspectives from the administrator. Uh, thanks also to Alex Hazley uh, of Deloitte for their support of the Future of DHS project. Uh, with me today, we have a panel of some of the most distinguished practitioners of uh, resilience, response, and recovery uh, in the United States from federal, state, and private sector uh, uh, backgrounds. Uh, to my immediate left is Willie Nunn, who is the FEMA Regional Administrator for Region 10, which includes Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, and 271 federally recognized Native American tribes. Uh, Mr. Nunn holds degrees from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and the University of Oklahoma. He served 26 years in the U.S. Air Force, including two combat tours, retiring as a full colonel. Uh, he joined FEMA in 2007 and has helped manage disaster response in 13 states and two territories. He has led units in FEMA's Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration and is a member of the FEMA leadership cadre and other senior positions. Uh, next to him is Gary O'Neill. Uh, we had uh, hoped to have Annie MacVest, Director of Oklahoma's uh, Department of Emergency Management and past president of the National Hazard Mitigation Association. We hope she's feeling better. But we're very pleased to have Gary here, who's the current president of the National Hazard Mitigation Association and is the director of mitigation grant services at Tetra Tech one of the country's leading uh, engineering consulting firms. Uh, Gary has served in state government and in private industry in disaster management and grants consulting. At NHMA, and I realize we're in uh, acronym alphabet soup today, uh, at NHMA, he leads a professional association of government and private sector executives working to reduce uh, the impact and cost of disasters around the United States. NHMA works on behalf of the mitigation practitioner community to advise the federal government, executive, and legislative branches on how to reduce the cost of disaster response. And NHMA does uh, public outreach to build community resilience to whatever disasters might occur. Next to Gary is Russell Strickland, who is the secretary of the Maryland Department of Emergency Management and is president of the National Emergency Management Association. NEMA. Uh, Mr. Strickland holds degrees from the University of Maryland and Frostburg State College. He has held emergency response positions in county and state government and serves on the Governor's Executive Council, State Cybersecurity Councils, and the National Capital Region Emergency Preparedness Council. As president of NEMA, uh, he le it leads one of the United States' leading professional organizations of government and private sector emergency management response professionals. They just finished their semi-annual conference uh, yesterday, and we'll be talking about that in just a few seconds. And finally, at the end, we have Josh Southlock, uh, who's managing director of Deloitte uh, Consulting and a distinguished senior fellow at the Global Resilience Institute. He holds a degree from George Washington University. Uh, Josh has served in three different presidential administrations as an advisor on climate change <clears throat> and resilience. He was lead for President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force, one of the largest federal government projects of its kind in history. So let me welcome our panelists today. Um, Russ, if I can start with you. Uh, uh, you've brought together over the past three days uh, uh, the, the leading experts in the country on emergency management and resilience. 
and so you've collected the wisdom from the country's top thinkers and practitioners in this area. Uh, uh, what are NEMA's priorities for 2024? What are you looking to, to accomplish during this next year? Well, thank you very much for the question. And thank you for recognizing the fact that uh, we did just have our 50th anniversary uh, where we brought together at our mid-year forum uh, 50, over 51 of our members. So our members consist of all the states, the territories, and the District of Columbia. Uh, we are focusing in three major areas. And the first is really recovery. Looking at what is it we can do to improve what happens with the survivor. And uh, with that, you know, it's, a, it's like a full court press of how can we, and we know that every state is different, but how can we exploit that such that the public is well aware of it, our profession is well aware of it, which then comes back to our second and third priorities, our workforce development and use of technology. But really keeping that focus on the survivor and what is it we can do individually within our states, within the resources and assets of our states and at the local level, but then collectively across all of our states, uh, particularly through our mutual aid uh, compact, how can we help each other when it's time to assist the survivor? And I think the number one, and really I think, I know, the number one focus with that right now is funding, is that we don't have adequate funding across the nation to really go deeper into the preparatory efforts for recovery. We're very, very much focused on before boom, and we have a pretty good handle on how to coordinate response, but it's when we get into recovery and all the different uh, attributes of that that we need to address and coordinate, it's, that's where we really need assistance and help, not only at the state level, but m even more at the local level to focus on that. So that's really where we're headed this year. Uh, thank you very much. Gary, for you, um, from the perspective of the hazard mitigation practitioner community out of which you come, uh, what do you want FEMA to focus on uh, going forward over the short and medium and long term? Yeah, please put your No, um, I would say that uh, you can't talk about what we want to want them to focus on without rewinding just a little bit. The recent past, I don't think there's anybody at this uh, podium here or out in the uh, audience or listening in that's part of the practitioner community or is involved with you in any way that can't look back at the level of innovation and the speed and the pace of innovation um, in terms of changes that have come out of that agency over the last few years, whether it's changes to IA we just got uh, shared with about earlier by um, Administrator Chriswell or changes to the benefit cost analysis process for uh, demonstrating projects that are more cost effective. It's yeah. a microphone issue, sorry about yeah. that. Um, whether it's changes to the benefit cost analysis process I just touched on or creating an entirely new program like the building resilient infrastructure in communities, updating our hazard mitigation assistance guidance, the, the level of innovation that's come out of FEMA over the past few years is, I mean, I hate to say it, I would, I would term it breathtaking. It's been really fast. Um, what I would want us to look at if I were king for a day or I were FEMA administrator for a day is to focus over the short, medium, and long term on operational efficiency. Uh, we want these programs and we want these innovations to be something that can speed up mitigation outcomes and recovery outcomes and increase resilience more quickly. Um, there's a lot of different ways to go about doing that and we can get into those discussions as we go here today, but I think that would be my main focus. And I think many in the practitioner community would agree we don't want to slow down resiliency efforts. We don't want to uh, uh, see these, the record investment that's been made in recent spending bills and allocations to the, uh, the agency uh, go to waste or disincentivize uh, local communities from uh, seeking those funds. So operationally, uh, we'd like to see them become as efficient as possible uh, over the, the next few years. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, Mr. Nunn, um, each region of the country faces different challenges in this area, uh, and so therefore the regions in which you have served are no exception to that general rule. Uh, uh, give us the, the benefit of your regional perspective uh, when you think about the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. Uh, uh, that brings to mind a whole series of 
possible horrible things that could go wrong that I know are really what you work on every day. What, what is the regional perspective uh, towards resilience in emergency response? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, this is a great opportunity to be here. Uh, my perspective, the regional perspective, is that we're there to build that resiliency, but also to build that help build capacity in our state, in our tribal nations. As, you, as it was said, I, I have 271 tribal nations with 229 in Alaska alone, uh, 29 in Washington, nine in Oregon, and four in Idaho. And each one's different. And with that perspective, and with a different type disasters that we have and the type of approaches that we have to take to, to, re, to prepare, mitigate, and respond and recover to those disasters is not a one size fit all. We have to uh, go through, with the innovation, we try to be more, more uh, efficient uh, because, and what it starts with is those relationships. Relationships and collaborations, not only with our tribal, state, and, and locals and uh, uh, partners, it's also with our private sector, with our volunteer agencies, and making sure we come together as a unity of effort. Uh, and thank you very much. Josh, uh, uh, how is responsibility for resilience handled in the emergency management community? Uh, you've seen it both from the White House perspective and from the private sector perspective. Uh, uh, how does resilience get put together and packaged and built into uh, emergency response? Well, I think this is uh, you know, a really <clears throat> important question, and, and the administrator talked a little bit about this. Um, so one of the things that's really important to understand is everyone has a responsibility in this space. Um, it's not just the federal government. It's not state, local, tribal, territorial governments. Um, it's not just the private sector. Uh, we all have a role to play. And NGOs, philanthropy, academic institutions. Um, so we've got a pretty good uh, uh, group up here, right? So we represent, I think we're all wearing a couple of different hats up here. Um, but the hat that we all wear, and everyone in the room and everyone watching, is that we're all citizens. We're all part of the community. And we have to be part of that community. And we have to do what the National Academy of Sciences uh, well, uh, a little more than 10 years ago, uh, wrote a report on, on the national resilience. And one of the things that they said is, we need to build a culture of resilience in this country. Um, and we need to keep doing that. We've gotten better, but we're not there yet. This is, a, this is an important piece, because it is a whole of nation problem, and it is going to take a whole of nation response to get there. Mm -hmm. So we all have roles, and we all have responsibilities. Um, so we, we just have to work better together. Um, and that's one of the things that I was really uh, excited to hear the administrator talk about. Well, one of the other things that was discussed um, uh, is, is the, the basic concept that where we are right now is uh, investments in resilience and preparedness are cost saving in, in the, the medium term. In other words, uh, it may not happen overnight, but the administrator referred to uh, a, a noted study, uh, which I brought up here as a visual aid, <laughs> um, uh, which documents the concept that on average, uh, uh, $6 are saved by every dollar invested in response. And there are some areas uh, which I know are important in the Pacific Northwest and in other parts of the country like Louisiana, Gary, where you're from, uh, where, where building to modern building codes uh, saves even more, $11 return on every dollar invested. Uh, right now, when the country is thinking about what the budget for the next fiscal year is going to be, uh, uh, you know, is, is, this, is, this, is it possible to understand uh, why we need to have statistics like this out there. Uh, and Josh, I'll ask you this first, and then, and Willie, your perspective. Uh, uh, why is resilience so hard to measure and to persuade appropriators that we're way up on the curve of, of the value saved of the investments in resilience? Let me, let me talk about it from a, um, why it's complicated, uh, why it's a complicated problem perspective. And, and one of the things that we have to remember about resilience is that 
it, it literally means to bounce back, right? If you go back to the first use of the word, um, Francis Bacon used it in the 17th century to describe an echo. It, it literally means to bounce back. And so in order to bounce back, you have to understand the, the threat and the vulnerability, and that gets you the risk, right? So it's a relative term. It's not an absolute term like um, uh, energy savings, really easy to calculate. Resilience is hard to calculate because you have to understand the threat, and the threat is variable. Every single disaster is different. They're like a snowflake, right? Each one. We can talk about planning and we can talk about different scenarios, but in the end, when you're on the ground, it's different. And so this is a hard thing for people to kind of comprehend, is that it's not as simple as if I do this, this doesn't happen because it's an average, right? So sometimes we take risks. And risk management is a complicated thing for people to understand. Um, there are a whole lot of budget issues, and I won't go into um, crazy budget math, but we know that if we don't invest in resilience, we are going to pay multiples after the disaster. And that's what the Mitigation Saves article just lays out very clearly. And Willie, what's your perspective in, the, in your region or other regions on how this return on investment really does pay off? Can you give us some examples? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, but uh, initially, uh, as the, region uh, the FEMA administrator said, uh, resilience makes a business case. It really makes a business case. For the Pacific Northwest, it makes a business case with the Uzinki, the village of, Native, of Uzinki uh, uh, building, having going there, making that bil village resilience, giving them direct technical assistance, allowing them to build that hazard mitigation plan and to also deter, be able to resist tsunamis, future tsunamis. And we have uh, evacuation shelters, mm -hmm. uh, first one on the West Coast now, uh, in Shoalwater Bay. And so changing that culture, uh, we may not be able to measure it, but I think on the ground, the people that we build those relationships on the ground with, they are seeing that they know they have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, they know that sometimes uh, we tell them that we try to get there within seven days. But on, on our worst day in the Pacific Northwest with Cascadia subduction zone, it may be weeks, it may be months, uh, 18 months without flushing your toilet. Mm -hmm. And we have to change that mindset on how, how, we, uh, how we prepare. And we're looking at how we, how we prepare good, better, and best, because not everybody can prepare, prepare for uh, two weeks of supplies, but they, they maybe can do one, and then looking at a community that can do more, because not everybody starts in the same place at a disaster. Yeah, well, and, and people need to be aware of the disasters that are, are unique to their areas yes. and be prepared for that kind of, of situation. Uh, Gary, uh, uh, you know, how do you think the country should appropriately address the funding challenges for emergency response we've been talking about? You have the benefit of both uh, private sector and, and your government experience. What, what do you think that the country should do on the funding challenge? Just give us some more. <laughs> Well, none of which goes to you personally, to be yeah. sure. But. <laughs> no, I think it's an, you know, we, we obviously see, I think yesterday we, we got the release that there were, as the administrator mentioned uh, earlier, 1,600 plus sub-applications for the flood mitigation assistance and the building resilient infrastructure and communities grant programs. It's our non-disaster cycle, our competitive grant cycles. They were uh, oversubscribed by almost like four times. And two, right at two billion available, there was eight billion in sub-applications or so approximately that were submitted. The need is there, and the ironic thing, I think we're talking in the green room, I made the point that the program, the RIC program replaced the PDM program, the pre-disaster mitigation program several years ago. That program used to be consistently undersubscribed every year. We couldn't give away the money that was there, and now all of a sudden you see it. So um, there's obviously a need for it. We don't have enough of it. Um, I think as emergency managers and hazard mitigation practitioners, the local officials have to uh, basically make a better case to their delegations, whether it's their state delegations, their congressional delegations, about why this is necessary. Um, you know, talking about building codes earlier, we just uh, updated our codes in our recent cycle in Louisiana. Part of the case we were able to make as to why that was important was showing them insurance information. In the last 11 years, in, excuse me, 10 years in Louisiana, there were 11 events, uh, 
presidentially declared disasters, that future flooding. Uh, 75, or three out of every four flood insurance claims were 12 inches of rain or less. We were able to successfully use that to paint the picture of why freeboard was necessary, uh, one foot freeboard was necessary for building codes. So I think that same thing can be, uh, that same method can be applied when it comes to mitigation. If we all join together, IAEM, NEMA, NHMA, our local folks, our state chapters, ASFPM, to paint that picture of why this is so critical and why it's so necessary. And we need to come up with other innovative solutions for the local match question as well, whether it's using CDBG in an innovative way or whether it's using you know, FEMA's uh, storm act, uh, safeguarding tomorrow, um, local match opportunities that uh, states have to set up now. But I think it takes, to your point, uh, not just a whole of government, but a whole of country approach to say, hey, we've got to invest more. We've got to maintain these investments and uh, these programs. Russ, this is a question for you and then, and then uh, for Josh as well. <clears throat> but uh, this, this highlights on something that Administrator Chris Well said that I think is one of the most important lessons that I hope our, our audience draws from this event. Um, and it's, it's the concern over the insurance overhang, uh, the possibility of a Category 5 hurricane striking a major U.S. city like Miami or an 8.4 earthquake hitting Cascadia region, uh, which is known in geologic history. Yes. Uh, and as you say, it's always earthquake season there. Um, uh, uh, and, and similar kinds of major events, uh, we really are looking at the possibility of the American insurance industry going into crisis, out of which uh, either it comes out of the full faith and credit of the US government and the taxpayers, uh, uh, or we, we literally lose the, the cushion of insurance that all of us as Americans are, are accustomed to and, and expect. Uh, uh, I, I tried to look up the history of the joke about the U.S. government being an insurance company with an army, um, and I do want to know who it is who gets top billing. Uh, uh, at the Atlantic Council, we care about both aspects of that. Uh, but, but Russ, what, what can we say about the, the, the possible consequences of um, uh, some kind of disaster that could overtake the ability of the American and indeed the global insurance industry to address? And what do you as, as president of NEMA want people to understand about the importance of mitigation steps to reduce the bill that will eventually come to all of us if that should happen, now, or when I, that should happen. I, I think that's an excellent point, and, I, and that, that really goes back to what we're talking about, like, like whole of country, whole of citizens prepared this. You know, we, we have got to start to build that message, <coughs> excuse me, where we're talking about a culture of resilience, where we've talked about a culture of preparedness for years, but we, we have got to get that down to the grassroots level so as the child is growing, that's a part of the mentality that begins. Now, that's not going to happen overnight, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, a, an, it's where we need to be innovative, I like that term, innovative in our public education system, all of our education system, to be bringing this into the future generations so they can think ahead. The same time, again, using the word innovation, we need to be working with the insurance industry to see what else, how else, and they do have some ideas of how we could have basically catastrophic type insurance for areas that we know are gonna be high risk, uh, very vulnerable, and high probability. And with that, there could be an, a type of insurance that would cover that area that it may very well, in the interim, be a better investment for state and local government to secure a policy like that for an area versus the money that might go into the immediate building of resilience, the, the mitigation kind of projects. And again, this, these are things that need to be, they need to be looked at and they need to be looked at for not in short period of time, but a long term. How is this going to improve? What are the probabilities as we go through time? And what is it, and how is it we can best invest to make sure that you know we we are in fact resilient? And Josh, your thoughts? Um, so insurance <coughs> is a is a really wicked problem, right? Because 
from a pure economic standpoint, it's pretty simple. You put money away so that when you have this episodic issue, you, you can fund it, right? Um, but it assumes certain things, like that people will make decisions that are rational based on the cost of it. And the problem is we live in communities, and we love the communities that we live in, and we don't want to leave them. And so it's hard to say to people, well, your risk is a little bit higher. Now's the time for you to move. It doesn't work that way. You have your community. You have your family. Um, and so we regulate insurance so that it kind of does this, and that messes up the economics, right? So it's, it gets very, very complicated. Um, what we have to do is understand that insurance is one form of risk management, right? There's, you, can, you can buy down the risk by basically building stronger, higher uh, in different places. You can transfer the risk, which is essentially what insurance is. You're just transferring that risk to someone else. Or you can accept the risk. And we make all three of these decisions every day, right? We, we do risk management every day. The problem with the risk transfer is if you don't do that risk transfer and you accept a risk that you are not prepared to handle, then that risk may get transferred to government. Mm -hmm. And then it's everybody's cost, right? If you think about Hurricane Sandy, we were talking about it earlier, um, Hurricane Sandy shut down the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut region for about two weeks. That's 9% of the GDP of the country. So that's an impact on everyone in America. Mm -hmm. um, and we see this happen, ports in, on the West Coast, uh, another you know, huge piece of our economic engine. Mm -hmm. And so we are all part of that, uh, that cost. Like we all, we all bear that cost, even if we live in a place that doesn't have a hurricane, doesn't have uh, a tornado or a tsunami, we are part of that and we have to work together. Well, and so, uh, Russ, if I may, uh, Maryland is exactly the state that Josh is describing. You don't have hurricanes uh, uh, or wildfires. They were impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Don't be, uh, don't be saying things like that. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, would. Uh, well, okay, you yeah. sure well, there's you, not you bourbon the in this? Yeah, you do have the Chesapeake, so uh, uh, global warming is a, a, a concern uh, or extreme weather. <sighs> Um, but, but, I mean, does the lack of, of epic disasters in states like Maryland make it easier or harder for you to, to do the work of, of strengthening resilience against uh, natural disasters? How do you, as, as the Maryland secretary for this, uh, uh, make the, the case to your legislators and, and executives uh, to get the kind of support that, that you need? It's uh, extremely difficult. Uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt, you know, one, we're, we're into the probability game. If, if you're a legislator and you look at what our history is and what our costs have been through that history, do I invest in that or do I invest in something else during the time period I have the opportunity to make that decision? One of the other greatest challenges to this and I, and I believe, well, first off, I believe all, all of our membership would say that within NEMA. But the other piece of this is that we are an upside down model. The way I invest in mitigation is because we were unfortunate enough to receive a federal declaration that had funding in it that allowed me to invest time, effort, and projects into mitigation, where we should have been, and we are now focused more on that, you know, on, on the front end, front loading of the problem. So it's, it's twofold. I mean, it's, and it's, how do I make the, uh, the case with our legislature? Is education. Um, we have received some really uh, exciting things in Maryland where we have a, a, an office of resilience, which is, uh, positioned in emergency management that gave us a chief resiliency officer as well as other staff. We have a revolving loan fund to help make the match if we on mitigation kind of projects. Uh, we have a disaster recovery fund that will help us, particularly when we can't make the federal threshold for disaster, that'll help us focusing again back on our survivor. All of these have been done 
because of legislators who have been in areas of our state where we either have had a federal declaration or we have not but had severe damage. So they experienced that and then have pushed forward. We have a couple of legislators who are very much interested in the environment and thus you know, push for resilience and what is it we can do to improve uh, based on all of that. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's working the problem at the grassroots level and being very comprehensive of what it is we have to work with within our state as well as with the people we have within our state. And, and we, we do a lot of convening and talking and, and educating with it. Um, uh, Willie, for you, uh, my, uh, my former Atlantic Council <coughs> colleague, uh, 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 Caitlin Durkovich, who is now the uh, Deputy Homeland Security Advisor to President Biden, uh, helped lead an effort that FEMA was very much involved in developing a, a national climate resilience framework. Um, and a lot of what we've been alluding to during our conversation here has, has involved that. And, and this being a think tank, uh, we're very proud of, of national frameworks. Um, but what I would like to ask you is, can you show us or give us some examples of how these kinds of strategic documents translate into what citizens actually see as improvements in their daily lives or as help to uh, uh, make something better after some disaster occurs. Yeah. And, and I'll start with <clears throat> when, I, when I initially moved about 25 years ago to the Pacific Northwest and they built our home, we had no air <coughs> conditioner. We needed no <coughs> air conditioner. Today, uh, well, 2009, uh, temperatures in 105 degrees. 2021, uh, 116 degrees uh, over multiple days. And so we have gotten programs that working with the working with the state of, uh, with the city of Seattle, uh, putting air conditioning systems into the public libraries for the heat heat wave that could come in. We also work with the city of Portland, uh, planting trees so we can have places for shade. Uh, we're doing that, and also retrofitting for for our earthquake with the seismic uh, retrofits for uh, apartment complexes. Uh, and all of these things, uh, as you look at history uh, and look at the, the, the data, uh, Cascadia is not if, it's when. Mm -hmm. We are in the 50-year window, uh, so to speak, for Cascadia. And knowing that, what, what, you have to explain what Cascadia is. Oh, I'm sorry. Other than just a geographical <laughs> yeah, yes, area, yes, sir. Uh, it's a uh, Cascadia sub, uh, subduction zone. It's a fault that lies off the coast, the west coast. And if that ruptures, it brings uh, rupture at a 9.0 earthquake. Uh, it brings a, immediately following a tsunami that can go inland and, and breach the coast. Uh, as you know, the I-5 corridor runs down uh, the west side of the nation. Uh, it could breach that coast uh, with, with damage uh, west of that corridor. And so uh, having that culture change to get people to understand that, and I think that is, is, it is the understanding of living in the, in the Pacific Northwest uh, and, and doing so. So um, looking out and how we work together and do that, and, and the, your, your uh, 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 move toward resiliency, that campaign toward resiliency, help us as we work with our communities. And Gary, when we think of some of the, the biggest potential price tags that the country could face, uh, hurricanes very much come to mind. Louisiana uh, uh, is, is very much in the, in the eye of the storm, as you would say. Uh, uh, in, in, the, in terms of what kinds of resilience steps you as an expert in engineering related improvements and, and things that can be done, can you give us some examples of, of how resilience translates into preparedness steps that will save lives and reduce property damage for the next big one? That's a good question, and we are, unfortunately and lamentably, very familiar with the impacts of hurricanes in South Louisiana, Louisiana in general, as well as the rest of the nation. But we're pretty intimately familiar with them, unfortunately. So um, I think there's several steps you can take. I think. Recently, one of our hurricanes proved to us that it, typically our, our standard operating procedures uh, in, in preparedness or in prep for a storm is we see it out in the Gulf. 
we know that you know within a few days it's going to make landfall. The cone of uncertainty or the cone of potential uh, path is leading towards us. And a lot of our SOPs when we were at, at GOSEP, the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, would revolve around you're at H120. In other words, landfalls expected to be at 120 hours out or 96 or 72. And different things, different contracts, different uh, steps got taken at each uh, milestone, so to speak. But our recent storm was just, it's really basic. It was sort of a uh, tropical event or a non, non-named storm that was just off the coast. And then within a short period of time, it, it, it intensified extremely and came on shore. We weren't able to let our bus contracts. We weren't able to issue evacuation orders like we normally would in a standard operating procedure for a hurricane prep. So what's that teach you? That teaches you a couple of things. The need for building codes and higher standards to exist uh, to protect your existing housing stock is vitally important, right? You've got to, um, if people are unable to get out, the structures they're gonna shelter in need to be hardened and they need to be uh, built to a different, <coughs> higher standard. Um, also think that in the case of our non-ambulatory folks, our medical special needs folks, we need to take a look at Anything uh, maybe south of I-10 or within those wind speed zones or those potential zones of uncertainty, you've got to start to harden healthcare facilities because if those folks are going to have to be forced to shelter in place, we're not going to be able to get those uh, those vulnerable populations out. Mm-hmm. You've got to create structures and facilities that are built to a higher standard, and whether that means you know inserting a, a safe room or retrofitting a safe room into that facility or maybe taking a look at the entire design criteria for that facility in general when they get built going forward. Um, I think those are steps, and when you talk about building codes, those are things that are costless, right? There's there's no there's no cost associated with you know I don't have to apply for a grant necessarily to go and uh, just change my building codes and increase my higher standards uh, if I'm a local community. So there are steps we can take that don't cost anything, but then the grant programs that are available and recovery funds that uh, FEMA makes available to us are things we need to engage with as well. So, and <clears throat> Russ, is the last question, uh, uh, you've obviously had the benefit of uh, several days of your semi-annual meeting, uh, preparing you for leaving messages with uh, members of Congress, especially as the the appropriations process wraps up for the next year, and everyone then starts on preparing for the next fiscal year's uh, budget debates. Um, w- what are the the important messages that your NEMA membership wants to leave for members of Congress and their staffs who might be watching us today? Well, one, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Two, we have... And, and you all vote. Yes, yeah, we all know well, that. And that's, we'll well, that'll be kind of like point number three. And, and, and point number two, we, we, we understand recovery, and they have placed us in a position of recovery now uh, with these actions. And three is that we in the emergency management community uh, are, are really realizing that we're a group of people who have continued to make it work no matter what. That's just our mentality. And we tend to be very isolated to ourselves when it comes to problems and challenges like this. Uh, We're walking away from Washington after this week that we are going to be reaching out to many other partners and bringing them into the fold to be, you know, those that represent the municipalities, those that represent the counties, those that represent the states, beyond just emergency management, because again, as we've talked here today, this is a whole of citizen challenge, and we have got to make our elected officials at the highest level understand that disasters are getting more, they're getting greater, and they're getting more costly. And we've got to solve that problem together. Well, that's uh, exactly the thought, I th- which I think we want to leave it on. Uh, thank you very much for coming to our discussion today, uh, building resilience in U.S. communities. Um, on behalf of the Atlantic Council, I want to give a special thanks uh, to Del Hardy Manson of our Future of DHS project and the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Uh, Dell is going off to the Department of Defense uh, after today's session, so we're very proud of his uh, uh, continued service in the interest of the security of our country. And for each of you, Willie, thank you very much for your work at FEMA. Gary, thank you very much for your leadership of the National Hazard Mitigation Association. Russ, it's a pleasure to be a citizen of yours, and thank you you for everything personally and professionally, uh, and for the work that you are doing at NEMA. Uh, and Josh, for your uh, expertise and experience 
uh, in giving us the broader perspective. Uh, thank you all very much on behalf of the Atlantic Council. Thank you very much, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you.